Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay and today my guest is Alan Lowen. Hi Alan. Hello. And Alan has written a book which is coming out later on this year called Keep Being Here Anyway and he runs a series of seminars and workshops called The Art of Being. And I've known Alan for a long time. I don't know him that well but I've known him probably about 30 years now and we've shared certain adventures together. We're going to talk about his life and his work and see what emerges from that. So, Alan, when you were four years old, you were adopted and put in an orphanage in England run by nuns. Yeah, actually I wasn't adopted. My father abandoned my mother when I was two and by the time I was four she was destitute. She had two children, my older brother who's 14 months older than me and it, it, as far as I knew she had no option or that was the best option she could find to put us in a Catholic orphanage and uh, it was an awful decision from my perspective <laughs> and uh, we were there for five years and uh, the nuns were, they were very heavy, oppressive, um, in certain moments even cruel and uh, for me it was an imprisonment. And it's a very impressionable age, isn't it, when you're four? Your, yeah. your basic personality is still developing. Yeah, for me it, it was um, a very wounding experience. I look at it now in a totally different light. I look back on those years and realize that it was actually an extraordinary training for the work I do with people because I went through so much and I had so many wounds to heal by the time I was in my 20s that nowadays when I'm working with people I feel like I can tune in with their woundedness very easily and be with them wherever they need to go in order to to heal and grow through whatever was was their pain in their story. So when you were I think around nine you came out you and your brother mm -hmm. Your, your mother had remarried, yeah. and so you had a new father, and you came out of the orphanage. Mm. And, um, you know, from what I read of the draft of your book, your new father actually had major issues going on because he'd been a prisoner of war in Germany for five years, and he actually found his own father hanging in a cupboard when he was very young. So that couldn't have been easy for right. him to accept you, and you have to accept him. Yeah, and you know, when that happened, he and the other children were all packed off to a Dr. Bernardo's home, and from there he went into a military school when he was mm. 15, and then into the army. He spent 25 years in the army, the last five of it, as you said, in the German POW camp. So his concept of family was non-existent, and he imposed barracks life on my brother and I, so that for me, coming home was was like out of the frying pan into the fire yeah. <laughs> and my answer to it was to take to the streets I just I was happier being out of the house and the the, the one thing that that was like a a, a, a a sweet element in all of this was uh, and it's strange I never doubted my mother's love for me I knew that she she was doing her best. I knew that putting us in the orphanage was devastating for her, which made it so that I couldn't tell her much about it because I knew it would be hard for her to hear. But I never doubted her love. It was yeah. just that she wasn't able to express it very much after the orphanage. Yeah. Whereas before the orphanage, you know, I, f I, th I think I, I had a, a wonderful love story with my mother. And so what I developed was an incredible longing for her that became part of my woundedness growing up. So what do you remember about that time, coming back from the orphanage to be with your mother and your new father? How were you in yourself? How did you see life then? Uh, I, th I felt elated to be out of the orphanage. It was, it was wonderful just to walk down streets and to be able to go to the park when I wanted. And uh, I saved up the money to buy a bicycle when I was 13 because I just had this, this passion for being out anywhere and not having to, to be enclosed in a system and run by people who um, 
yeah, as I say, were really oppressive. I, I hated school. I went to Brighton Hove and Sussex Grammar School, and it was a kind of snobbish grammar school that had pretensions towards being a semi-public school. And I, it was a boys-only school, and there was nothing about it that I liked, so I was into not being there a lot and playing, playing truant, and at the same time just looking for ways to, to get through. For me, it was, life was pretty much about, about trying to feel good in a not very good environment. Mm -hmm. I joined a church choir, and I joined it because I met some kids on the school playground who said, we have a lot of fun after choir practice. And every kid in that choir was a semi-delinquent. And we took to the streets and we got into trouble every Tuesday and Thursday evening and wrecked minor havoc around the neighborhood. And for me, that was a lot of fun. But at the same time, I loved singing. I, I was totally happy to go to church three times on Sunday and sing in this choir. And it was because something happened when I was singing. I remember one Sunday evening, I must have been 11 or 12 years old. I think it was my first experience of, of something beyond this rather dreary life. I was, I was singing and the, the sun was shining through the western um, stained glass windows of the church. And as I was singing, suddenly I was transported beyond me and these people and all the things and the trappings of ordinary life. And I was in a state of ecstasy where I felt for a few, I don't know, minutes or seconds, I have no idea. But I was, I was totally in bliss and in harmony with everything. And I think that was really my first spiritual experience. And uh, <coughs> it went along with feeling something like being in love when I was singing. That was how it was for me. It was like a liberation. Yeah, you, I talk, you talk in the book about how the light came on. Yes. It was a whole new world for you, a yeah. whole new experience, a whole new feeling. It was. And... Um, the other, w the other way that I would find anything like that was going to the movies <laughs> in the orphanage. I had never experienced cinema until our final months when things were beginning to change and the nuns had brought in a, a projector and they began to show movies. And shortly before we left, we got to have our first experience of the cinema. And the first movie they showed <laughs> was David Copperfield, <laughs> which was so appropriate for these lost kids in this orphanage to, to be there watching David Copperfield find his way into something good out of all this misery. But I was, I was so awed by this this experience, it carried me out of myself mm. and my misery. And after I, I got out of the orphanage, this was one of the ways that I could enjoy life, going to the movies. And I remember reading some years ago Joseph Chilton Pierce's book. I don't think it was A Magical Child. I think it was the one after that, where he talks about cinema as being one of the ways that people come close these days to having something like a spiritual experience and it just totally rang bells for me mm. because the fact is when you go to the cinema and you sit there in the dark and you're watching this movie happening there's no interference it there's takes no you out of your drama doesn't it right and right it projects you into some a fantasy in yeah. a way yeah yeah so you've got a job your first job i think you were telling me earlier was working in insurance, <laughs> which you didn't take to very well, did you? You know, I had, I had left school early. I just, I couldn't stand it. And one day I went into the, knocked on the headmaster's door. It was when I was studying for A-levels. And I, I said, uh, I'm leaving school. And he said, well, 
you've had one foot out of the school for long enough, Lowen. You may as well remove the other one. And I did. And then, of course, I had to find a job. And I was interviewed and, uh, by this insurance company in Brighton and appointed. And it was clear the manager saw in me a young, uh, rising possibility who could go to the heights of the <laughs> insurance company. And after six months, I was just appalled that, oh my God, is this what my life is going to be about? Mm. I have to get out of here. And he had been so kind to me during that six months. And when I told him I was leaving, he was furious. And uh, I'd broken all his plans. And he, he, he was like a father figure in a way. But he had aspirations for his adopted son. And his, his son wasn't interested. <coughs> so Listen. then I went back to college, evening classes. Yeah, because something in you, I think, at this point was beginning to realize that obviously that life could turn out pretty boring, take you away from joy, if you like, yes. take you away from this taste you'd had when you were singing. Mm. And you, you wanted to find out more about the beginning of how you worked as, a, as an individual, how you, how you ticked, if you like. So I think you started psychology. You studied psychology then, didn't you? No, first I went to teacher's training college. Okay. I, I was... I look back at it now and I see that I was homing in on what mattered, where I needed to go. And becoming a teacher, what attracted me was that I would be uh, personally engaging with young people and I already felt like, you know, I can help them. And um, <coughs> so I went to teacher's training college and from there I got a really, really good job in a comprehensive school outside London probably became the youngest ever head of an English department. I was made head of the department after I'd been teaching for 15 months. I was only three, three months out of my probationary year. And then I spent four years running this English department and was given <coughs> a year off at the end to complete this psychology degree that I was doing at Birkbeck. I was going down to London University in the evenings to Birkbeck College and I completed my psychology degree. And after that, I, I, I realized, well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's... Well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in following the, the kind of spiritual <coughs> theme here. So there was, for me anyway, there was obviously something in you that was trying to drive forward in terms of understanding how you yeah. worked and maybe the bigger picture of how life worked. And this... Yeah seemed the beginning of that process. It was. For me, the most exciting thing about teaching and running that English department was the freedom I was given to do my own thing. And for me, creative drama was the, the key because what I wanted to do was to turn the kids on to themselves and, and to get them really fascinated with life in the way that I was sometimes fascinated and looking for, looking for the real meaning. And... And so these creative drama sessions, I would take the kids to the, to the gym and we would improvise around the significant themes of their lives. I look back at it now and I see it was really embryonic of what I later created as the art of being. And, and at the same time, there was this deep sense of there's, something's not okay here. And one summer afternoon I walked into the classroom and the kids were really fidgety. It was a beautiful afternoon. I'd been out outside the back of the school lying in a field during the lunchtime just enjoying lying there and under the sun in the long grass. And I, I looked at these kids and two thoughts came into my head immediately. The first was these kids don't want to be here. And the next one was <coughs> nor do I. And it was, uh, again, one of these epiphanous moments. And that was really the end of my teaching career. I realized I was looking for something and I had found something in teaching, but I felt so um, encased within 
the English education system with all its requirements and curricula and examination needs and so on, that somehow in the end the kids and I were uh, compelled to do be in something that wasn't necessarily what we were really looking for. And so then I, I applied for postgraduate work. Uh, I wanted to do a, a master's or a doctorate and got accepted at Oxford and went there to do memory research, to do a defil in. And then at some point you found this book by Carl Rogers, which was, yeah. uh, uh, in my notes here, taken from your, your draft book. You felt you'd never felt so spoken to in your life before. Yes. What was it about this book that really spoke to you? Well, psychology study had become a real disillusionment. I, I went from teaching into studying psychology because I, I thought, psychology, okay, that's about people. This, maybe I'm going to find the meaning, <laughs> the meaning of life here. And I became more and more disillusioned with what experimental psychology was all about, rats and statistics and um, this breaking down of, of people into these categories, learning, motivation, personality, social, and so on. And none of it, it, it didn't make anything whole. And then uh, one day I walked into a bookshop in Oxford and saw this book on encounter groups. And I'd have been hearing the name, the word encounter groups. And I'd heard a little bit of this guy, Carl Rogers. So I, I bought the book. It was a little penguin book. And I, I went home and read it that evening. And by the time I got to the end of it, I was in another state, and yes, like you say, it was for the first time in my life, I was reading something where I felt like, this man is really talking to me about the situation that I am, I'm in, where I'm trying everything and I feel lost and I can't find what it's all about. And at the end of the book, there was information about this program in California, in La Jolla. It's called the La Jolla Program, 17-day encounter group community and I decided right there and then I'm going and the next day I was on the phone and you know this was it wasn't easy to, to yeah you no know. you made a big jump and let's just run through that group because some very significant things happened to you yeah. on day three <laughs> start with day three day three okay so there's 120 people on the program and we're broken down for uh, into these groups of about 15 with a facilitator and on the third day of being in this small group I'm being confronted by the whole group because I'm as far as I'm concerned I'm this I, I, I'm together I'm intelligent I know what life's about I've got this even though I don't <laughs> I've got this whole front that I put on when I'm with people and I know how to perform and I know how to look good and they're calling me on all my trips and and it, it, it goes on for a few hours until finally I come apart at the seams and I'm this pool of tears on the floor absolutely ashamed and devastated that I've been reduced to tears by the confrontation of these people who are just saying you know we don't believe you that's basically what they were saying to everything. Yeah, Come on. So just, just to explain people that don't know, at that time, encounter groups were becoming quite popular, and it was very much taking the word encounter. It was a group of people, and you would encounter somebody in terms of almost like a confrontation yeah. and challenge them to try and be real and find, help, find and help them find a deeper level of who they, were, who they really right, were. Right, the, the essence of the encounter group is through encountering each others, we get to encounter ourselves. Right. And, you know, the, the, the underlying um, principle in Carl Rogers' encounter group is that people are good for each other and that when we are real and open and honest with our feelings, that this is, it's, it's infectious. We catch it from each other but in order to do so, we have to drop our defences and our defence mechanisms. And this was why they were confronting me, because they could see I was just a mass of defence mechanisms. And yeah, and that's hard for all of us to yeah. just drop that, because that yeah. we were so identified. It's the first great opening, and so it was for me on that third morning. And I, as I say, I, I just came apart at the seams, and I was 
I, I felt so ashamed to be reduced to tears because mm. I had spent all these years learning how to build myself up from the from the wounded kid who came out of the orphanage and they were taking it all apart and then the next thing I know they're all around me and they're loving me and they're letting me know hey you know it's fine you're allowed to feel all this and I come up out of these tears just shining and and realizing for the first time in my life that I'm in touch with myself and that I'm I've actually found what I've been looking for all these years which is that it's all right to be me and then this was the third day and every day after that in these groups was was like more and more doors opening in myself and becoming um, more and more playful and alive and free and this went on and on and then day 14 I think day 14 say, yeah, right yeah. day 14 there was a community meeting in the afternoon and by now I I just felt that day I, I didn't want to be with people I just felt like I want to be on my own and I went down to the beach and sat on the sand and feeling wonderful and after a, a little while a young woman who was also on the program came down and joined me and sat beside me and said is it okay if I'm here I said yeah it's fine and then I lay down and fell asleep and I don't know how long I was asleep but suddenly I woke up and I really woke up I woke up like I'd never woken up in my life it was even beyond what had happened singing in the choir when I was 11 12 it was as though it wasn't even as though I was one with all of creation I was one with the sea and the sky and the sand and the people around and the birds and the sounds and it was all happening timelessly it was like the fusion of of the moment and eternity I was I, I, it wasn't even right to say I was totally present presence was happening and I was simply the conscious celebration of it all and I was in this state for maybe half a minute and then this woman who was sitting there I guess she sensed that I'd woken up and looked around and she looked at me she said are you okay and I said yeah yeah I'm fine I'm fine and it just jolted me out of it but it 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 never went away that was well that was I don't know how many years ago it was 1973 74 so it was a long time ago and the experience of those 30 seconds became the guiding light of my life from then on I would go in and out of that state again and again and again and I could lose it for months on end and yet I could never forget from from then on I could be lost but I knew where home was I I knew what it was all about it was like I'd been given the key the meaning is it there now yes it is isn't that wonderful isn't it yeah yeah and it's, as you say it's the key it's home I guess it's who you really are is that, is yes. that right yeah. yeah and for me it's who we all really are it's the it, it's what happens when we open through all our defenses and say yes to all that we are the realization one day suddenly happens that the story doesn't begin and end with me that I am just a manifestation of something that is so universal and eternal that the little issues really can't matter that much and the paradox of it is at the same time that the little issues of ordinary life are seen in a new perspective it also gives me this this passion to live this moment as fully as totally as I can so that I I have a natural joy to participate fully in whatever is happening here and now and so I see it as the most creative way that anybody can be engaged in their life
not busy with what was that and, and somehow um, defending all their issues and, and being political and calculating, but being able to bring all their resources to this moment. So to keep, keep the, yeah. the story running, right. um, and we have to move quite fast now in terms of there's a lot to cover in, it, <laughs> in our allotted time slot here. So you, you came back to London and then you uh, started in your own way to lead encounter groups, which you really enjoyed doing. But your life, uh, in the draft of your book that I read, you were saying your life was still a mess. You were smoking some dope sometimes and some other practical side. Was, I think you were living in a squat. The practical side wasn't yeah. great. And then you got involved with uh, community was called Quasitor, became community. You were uh, leading encounter groups there. And then someone there, Michael Barnett, I think gave you a tape to listen to, audio tape, of an Indian guru called Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. Just, just talk us through how it was the first time you heard that tape and your reaction, your response yeah. to that. Yeah. The, I joined Michael's... Um, three-month intensive. I was, I was leading workshops at, at community. There were two centres, Quasitor and community. There were different centres. Um, Both based in London. Yeah. They, yeah, they, they yeah. were the centre of quite a vibrant scene in London of personal development. Yeah, they, they were the two major personal development centres, not just in London, but in England and two of the, the major ones in Europe. And um, community were very welcoming of me. I said, I want to lead encounter groups for people in the education world because that was what I knew. And I mean, this is cutting a long story very short. So I, I had resigned from, I didn't complete my doctorate at Oxford yes, after that yes. experience. And so it changed the course of my life. And so, yes, so Michael had founded Community and he most of the time wasn't there. He was in India. And when he appeared, he'd be wearing orange and this mala, which really, for me, was a bit of, who is this guy? And I, I don't like gurus. I am my own master and so on. But I, he was a very charismatic man, and I wanted to do a training with him. And I kept on hearing about Bhagwan. So one evening, I, I took a cassette tape, and I took it to my room, and as I was lying in bed before going to sleep, I turned it on and I didn't go to sleep. I was totally shocked because I, I just knew I have to go and meet this man. He was a guru. I didn't want to be with a guru, but the fact was that listening to him, I was listening to a being who was present and awake beyond anyone that I'd ever experienced. Just hearing his cassette, I was awed at where he was coming from. It was like he was streets ahead of any of the people that I was training with. And I was always looking for good teachers. And that for me was like the awful realization, okay, I don't want a guru, but this, I, I, I'm looking for, for teachers, for people who are more awake, more loving, more present than I am, and this one. I have to go meet. And that's such a key, what you've said. This, and I know in my own life, that's been very important and very prominent as well. Always looking for someone that knows more to learn, yeah. to find out more about myself, ourselves, and mm. about life. Mm. And I, oh, I always feel that people that don't do that somehow shortchange themselves. Absolutely. And you know, I was never interested in any technique. There were so many techniques that you could get into. Bioenergetics, gestalt, psychodrama, endless psychosynthesis. And the techniques never interested me. Yeah. What mattered was the person. And okay. that would take me into different techniques. I would hear about... So you got to India, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you sat with him for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and he said, here's your new name. And he said, your name is Swami Anand Rajen. It means a king of bliss. And I felt wonderful. And then he talked to me for 20 minutes, telling me, but you are a beggar of misery. And totally demolishing my group leader ego. I had a new ego by now. You know, I was a group leader. I'm helping people. I'm leading encounter groups. 
I was feeling very good about myself, except for all the bits of my life that were still a mess. And, you know, basically he said to me, you have to go in now and find your inner kingdom. You have to change this beggar of misery into a king of bliss. And it was like he'd given me the name that was a key for where I, I need to be heading. And you had no doubts, even though you had resistance to go there, you saying you didn't want to have a guru. When you got there and you were in this new community, you felt completely fine there, completely... I had... I had all kinds of questions. My personality had endless questions, but the simple fact was that when I sat with him, every time I sat with him in discourse in the morning, in darshan in the evening, every time I found myself opening into this state of presence. I was at the beach in California, singing in the choir when I was 11. This same space would just open up. Everything would fall away, simply being in yeah. his presence. So it's as and if you had this consistent reference point, probably isn't a exactly, very good word, but yeah. it's, it has to do now, of, and you would re-experience that. Yeah. And it, I guess it got stronger, did it, every time you re-experienced yes. it? Yes, and, and the fact was that I was practicing it every day, you know, mm -hmm. two hours in the morning, up to two hours every evening, and this went on for three years. And at the same time, living in this community around him, that was full of these vibrant, creative Westerners who, like me, had all joined, come to Pune to be with this man. So what was the common thread? Why did, and that was my experience, I was also a, hmm. a, a sannyasin, a like, disciple of, of Bhagwan, although I joined a bit later. And that was my experience too. There was so many interesting, crystallized, creative people that joined. In your view, why was that? Why were these people being pulled there? You know, a lot of us were coming out of the 60s. A lot of us had, you know, we'd gone through the whole sex and drugs and rock and roll thing. And we'd had our awakenings. I think probably most of the people there had caught a glimpse somehow. And at the same time, it was only a glimpse or glimpses. And no matter how often they happened, there was a sense of ordinary, li ordinary life doesn't cut it. They were too ensconced in all the, um, the conventions that, that make life be about uh, success and competition and consuming and getting and always having this sense of there's got to be more to it than this. And... Yeah, we'd had our glimpses, and we, we uh, it wasn't just marijuana, but marijuana and LSD and mushrooms uh, were all ways to open into there is, there is something beyond this. They gave you a taste, didn't they? They <coughs> exactly. didn't give you the real thing, but they gave right. you a taste of a possibility. Right. And then, you know, to, to be drawn, however it happened for them, I mean, through me, for me it was through listening to a cassette, to go there and to be with him, the same thing was happening for everybody that was happening for me. They would sit in the discourse and he was extraordinary. He could talk to 3,000 people and you'd come out of the discourse and everybody would say, I felt like he was talking to me, very yeah. personally. Now the theme was very much surrender. Yes. And I know that was uh, when we were talking earlier. Mm -hmm. That was a big issue for you, surrender. What did that mean for you then? And what does it mean now, surrender? What it meant then was that I felt, I felt still the, um, the control of my personality. And what that means is I had all my agendas, my conditions, my attitudes, my opinions, my beliefs, and they're like the clothing around this beingness that I could come into in these precious moments. And I felt as though my, my conditions and attitudes ran my life. And when I went to Pune and sat with him, what I saw in this community around him was people who were learning to live in their being. And to sit in meditation with a master is one thing. You know, it's easy then to just come into this state of sublime presence. But to, uh, to work 
and to socialize <coughs> and to um, have to do things in ordinary life, it's not so easy to not be caught up in your personality. And the commune around him, the ashram, was a place where it was, it was run by a group of women who were running it on his behalf, and we di didn't even know how much interchange went on between him and them, but they defined our lives. And so surrender for me meant I, I choose to be a disciple. I choose to be with a master. And the reason I choose to be with him is because in his presence, I come into the state of presence. And it's clear to me that when I go out of his presence, I get back into my ordinary personality structured way of living. And I want to find I, I want to learn how to not be run by my personality. And it was, it was very obvious, and I knew this already from my, my encounter group work, that what I had to do was to find a way that I wasn't running, this I, this ego, wasn't busy running my life. And the, the commune, the ashram, was an alternative, and he, he was his, what he created was brilliant because he gave us his presence in meditation and around that he gave us this western world of the commune where we didn't decide for ourselves what we do there. I was given my work. I was told, okay, you're leading these, these groups every month and in between you're editing his, his books. And everybody was told what they would be doing. I was, I was um, told where I would live. Um, I was given, given a room which I shared with another man who lived the other side of a screen and a loft was put in and an Indian man lived up there with his grandmother. And always there would, my personality would, would get into these every day, day after day would get into, I don't want to do this, you know, this isn't how I want to live. And I would see, yeah, that's what runs me. I want and so I decide. It's like, it's triggering <coughs> so many, there's so many angles all the time, your deep conditioning and it's bringing out what you, what you learnt from the orphanage, what you learnt from being yes. with your parents. And it's, you're confronted, aren't you? Yes, Internally, absolutely. you're confronted with all this deep conditioning, which it takes courage to stay with. Yeah, it, it does. And, and for me, the, the key was his saying one day in Pune, I'm not giving you the Garden of Eden. Any idiot can learn to trust in the Garden of Eden. I'm giving you the marketplace. And in the marketplace, anything can happen. Mm. And that's where you learn real trusting. And I'm going to make it more and more difficult for you to trust. One day I'm going to make it impossible for you to trust. And still you have to trust. Only then the miracle happens. And for him, the miracle was enlightenment. And I, I wasn't interested in this great golden carrot of enlightenment. But I was interested in getting free of all this conditioning that ran my life. And so this became like a mantra for me. Uh -huh, okay, I'll, I'll keep on trusting. I'm willing to go this journey. I'm willing to burn my personality up through surrendering my life into the hands of the master and the community that he's created around okay. me. Okay, so I know in Pune in India <laughs> that you felt that worked and you felt good and then you went away for a time and then, and then the history very briefly is that Bhagwan moved from India onto a ranch in Oregon, in North America, and there was a whole community built there. And then you, despite reservations, moved to that community, uh, the ranch, let's call it, in Oregon, and you repeated mm -hmm. your work there. So how was that moving from Pune to Oregon, although I know you did it indirectly? <coughs> well, to cut a long story very short, it became about what he'd said, that one day I'm going to make it impossible for you to trust, and still you have to trust. I hated the ranch from the day I was there. I actually left after a week, but three months later I went back because 
I just knew inside, my work as a disciple isn't finished. I have to see this surrender game through to the end. Because you thought it was like a prison, didn't you, it, when you it, went there for a It was like week. the orphanage again, you know, it, which it was prison It took you back to the orphanage. It, yeah. it really did, in a way. It was like the rules and regulations were coming down thick and fast. It was like there was another rule every day. <coughs> and in the, in the, he didn't speak to us for, for four years on the ranch. And it was only in the final year that he began to speak again. And once again, I got to sit with him. And the way that happened was, was also mysterious, but I won't go into it now. But I... Because there was one evening where he declared you enlightened. You were saying at your talk the other night. Well, in, OK. Uh, so I was leading an encounter group or, yeah. uh, on the ranch. And the door opened. And one of the women came in and said, Rajen, be at Jesus Grove at 6 o'clock. Uh, freshly washed, no fragrances, clean clothes, and I knew what that meant from Puna. It meant, oh my God, I'm going to get to sit with him again. And I was elated and um, duly went to Jesus Grove, which was the offices at the centre, and there were 20 of us. There should have been 21, but one, one guy was away. And we were um, bussed up to his compound and taken in and... There were the cushions and his chair, and I sat down, and he came in, and for the first time in four years, he talked to us. And again, immediately, I was in this state of simple presence. And uh, after a little while, he started to talk about enlightenment and how we were so unable to accept that we could be enlightened. We were like... Um, the rose that can't accept itself, whereas a rose has no issues, it just is the rose, and he talked about the rose. And then he said, you know, and some of you are enlightened, and he began to name people. I wasn't one of them. And I just sat there looking at him like I'm looking at you and just, just loving being there anyway. And then he said, ah, and I forgot, and Rajen. And so I was declared enlightened. And for me, you know, this, this dance of surrender, the, the paradox of it, of course, is am I surrendering to you or am I surrendering to me? And it was really paradoxical because, and, and it's in the very essence of the master-disciple game because you give yourself, you, you choose to surrender to the ways of the master so that he can bring you home to yourself and it's a funny game to play and you know we could talk about it for hours the the light and the dark of it but anyway I went out of there and by the time I got out the, the word was all over the ranch that these people have been declared enlightened yeah. and uh, it was supposed to be top secret but that you know in the in the in Bhagwan's world the secrets <laughs> were very open in a very short time Anyway, we, we, have to, we have to keep going <coughs> yeah. at the pace because we're yeah. being quite short of time. So you eventually left the ranch. And what, what was the reason you left in the end? I left because my mantra had become now how much longer. I, I saw that, that it wasn't the same anymore. He could be in this state of presence, but he could be in other states as well in those evening darshans on the ranch. And then Sheila, the, you know, the whole corruption thing Sheila blew up. Sheila was his secretary who ran, was the, ran the, uh, yeah, the organization. Yeah, yeah and uh, she suddenly took off with a bunch of her, um, her buddies who were running things and the feds were coming after them, basically. They were with indictments and were coming in to arrest them. And they fled from the ranch and everything went chaotic. And I, um, I was in London. I, I was constantly being sent out to lead workshops around the world. And uh, I was in London waiting for a visa, business visa, to go to Australia before going back to the ranch. They needed me to go and lead some workshops there. And I called the Sydney Commune and the guy on the other end of the line. I said, hey, what's happening with my business visa? And he said... Rajan, you're not going to get your business visa. Bhagwan just got arrested trying to leave the States. 
and he was flying out with some friends, some, some wealthy sannyasins. And for me, it was the end. It was, it, it hit the place in me where I trusted that he could push everybody's buttons and he could, he could antagonize the American government and he would simply be there. And the fact that he, as I saw it, ran away was the, um, for me, it was the catalyst. It, it, it freed me. Something was finished, wasn't mm. it? I, I, I got up when I heard the news and I spent the whole day walking through London realizing, oh my God, I'm, I'm free. I'm, I don't have to do this anymore. I can what just... What did that feel like? It was, it, it was again, it was La Jolla. Yeah. It was, it was bliss. For a, for a whole day, I just yeah. walked the streets of Isn't London. Isn't it interesting, this rediscovery of this essential state, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is so tangible at the time, and then yeah. somehow gets covered on the journey yes. and then <laughs> appears again. Yes. I just, I just like to... I've got so many notes I made here, but i just like to cover what happened when Bhagwan, he became Osho, he moved back to India, and then he, he finally died. Just talk us through that experience. That's okay. very interesting what you told me earlier about so that. Once I let go, I be, I, I, the first thing that happened was I was excommunicated. And I'd seen this happen to other, other people in the sense that Bhagwan, by now Osho, let people know they should have nothing to do with Rajen. He, he's a baddie. And uh, at a certain point, I was asked to let go of the name Rajen. And I argued with that one for a little while. And then I thought, no, this is, I need to let go of it anyway. It's time to come back to being Alan. So I did. And then during the five years after the ranch ended until his death, <coughs> I would alternately get invitations to, to come back and messages that he was bad rapping me in the discourses. And <coughs> a few months before he died, I, I heard that he was saying in his discourse in Pune that um, Alan Lowen, who used to be Rajen, was very angry with him and saying bad things about him. And none of this was true. And I wrote to him and I I said, you know, I just want you to know that I love you and I'm grateful and I wish that you could accept me the way I am. And for me, this was the most bizarre thing that I could say to him because he was the being I had gone to years before because I felt so totally accepted by him. So I sent off the letter and forgot about it and got on with my life. <coughs> and at that time, I was never invited to... Um, sannyasin Rajneesh happenings. But one morning on Maui, where I was living, I got a phone call from a, a sannyasin on the island, old friend of mine, and she, she said, Rajen, she called me Rajen, she said, um, Osho just left his body, and we're, we're, um, we're, we're meeting and meditating, you're invited to join us. And I was really happy to be invited, and I went there and sat, and after a couple of hours, I suddenly remembered this letter that I'd written, and the same moment that I remembered the letter, I knew, it was like the light again, I knew that there was a reply for him, from him, in my P.O. box in town. And I walked out of the meditation, drove into town, opened my P.O. box, and there was the letter. And he didn't write himself, he dictated to his secretary, and she was, she said, Osho wants you to know that everything's good and you're totally welcome anytime. And after that, I was going to go to Pune, but I, I wasn't able to, but yeah. a month later... Like a completion, wasn't it? Yeah. Which must have been a wonderful feeling. It was, yeah. Like a healing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wanted to... We have about five minutes left, and I want to give you a couple of minutes towards the end of that five minutes to talk about the work you're doing now. But... I, was, I just found it so interesting, and, and you, you're with your book, uh, Keep Being Here Anyway, which is coming out later this year, you talk a lot about your childhood and your relationships. And one, and one thing that, 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 re that really impacted me was that you, were, you spent five years um, in the orphanage between 
between four and nine years old. And then you were, when you were in your early 20s, you had a, a daughter that you then gave away for adoption. Yeah. And I, I just thought that was so fascinating in so far as, in a way, you were continuing that pattern. And until you started to do this work on yourself, that was probably, most of your life would have been continued patterns. And then once you started to look, you started to break this conditioning. But it shows to me how deep the conditioning is, that you were put in an orphanage and you did the same thing to your daughter. I'm not saying mm. at all in a bad way, it's mm. just what happened. And then also, you, I know that around that time or slightly earlier, you went to France, I think it was, to meet your father. To Belgium. To yeah. Belgium, yeah. Mm. So let's just very briefly yeah. talk about those, those two situations. Yeah. For me, the giving up our daughter for adoption was one of the most painful, maybe the most painful period of my life. And I, yeah, I, I didn't see how I was replicating patterns. When I was 20, I went to Belgium. I was hitchhiking. I, every summer I would go hitchhiking around Europe. And I just felt suddenly, I want to see my father again. I, I want to know who he is. And so I found him, and it was a very disappointing meeting. And I, I came out very disillusioned and actually feeling like, wow, for all that my life was such a, a crazy, painful happening up to now, I'm glad that he didn't bring me up. Mm. I didn't like who he was and how narrow and bigoted. And um, at the same time, the going to see him, the finding him, what is really bizarre is how that uh, happened again and again. After, I di my mother didn't know about the, the daughter that was adopted, but one day I told her, and then she told me something that just totally blew me away, that when we were in the orphanage, she had another child and that she had given her up for adoption. Mm. And then, years later, when I was living on Maui, one day my mother called me and said, Alan, Alan my daughter's found me. What, what shall I do? What, what can I do? I said, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to meet her? And she said, yes, yeah. I said, well, what do then? Meet her. Yeah. And they became friends. Yeah. And then, years after that, my adopted daughter found me yeah. and we're now on this journey of reconciliation and it's so it's as though the the healings that have happened on my journey are somehow they they somehow they permeate out to yeah. include others too is it is this if you've dug really deep in yourself and that as you say permutates yeah. out and has effects around you and the mm. people around you. Mm. So just talk, we have a couple of minutes left, just talk very briefly about Art of Being the workshops, what if someone decides to go to one of those, what they would expect. Well, the themes, you know, for me the themes of the Art of Being workshops are the essential themes of people's lives. So I, I work with birth and death, with sexuality, intimate relationship, reconnecting with the soul, and the workshops are ways that people can um, enter into what the art of being really means through what they're attracted to, which is wanting to work on this particular theme, like sex or death or so on. <coughs> and the essence of the work is to give people ways to reconcile with whatever they're not in friendship with in themselves, whatever they're judging in themselves, because in this process of befriending what they're not in friendship with, whether it's their sadness or their sexuality or their joy um, or their self-esteem or their soul connection. But what happens is as we make friends with all of that, we become more and more whole. And in becoming more and more whole, we're able to have a more and more total experience of being. And what happens then is that this invites, you can never make it happen, but it invites, eventually, that opening that I experienced on the beach in La Jolla, sitting with Osho, and so on. 
yeah. it invites the spiritual awakening as well. It and really in the process, a beautiful healing of one's, one's being. It really is an art of yeah, being. And you exactly. have to understand that art, don't you? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Alan, it's been fascinating. I wish it had been a longer time, but we're now up to 55 minutes, so we need to, we need to sign off. Thank, Thank you for you. coming into Conscious TV. And your book again is Keep Being Here Anyway, yes. which should be out later on this year. I so hope so. Yeah. We look out Thank for you, that. Ian. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you. Thank you, everyone, for uh, watching Conscious TV, and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>